Yo, yo, what's going on, everybody? I hope you're having a good one so far. So before we get into the podcast, I would absolutely love it if you could go and subscribe to the podcast and give us a little review uh, or some stars or whatever you can on your platform. Um, it just keeps the podcast going. So on today's podcast is Kat O'Dell. Kat is a food writer slash food critic. Um, she has worked with Vogue Eater um, and has this insane Instagram that just makes my mouth water every single day. I didn't know Kat before I got on the conversation with her and she's absolutely amazing and is talks about her new projects that are happening in the future with her and her husband. Um, really, really enjoyed this conversation. So without further ado, Kat Adele and we're live. Kat, how's it going? Hey. Good. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, you are. Uh, it's it's it's, near, it's Thanksgiving week this week. Yeah. Are you prepping it for it? Um, yeah. So I'm in I'm in New York right now in the Hamptons. But um, I was supposed to fly out to Houston on Wednesday um, for my husband's uh, to go to my husband's husband's family's house. But we literally like an hour ago decided to uh, 86 that just with like the rise of COVID again and being in airports. So now we're going to stay here with my family, which my family is like, of course, but that means I have to like rewrite the menu of what I wanted to do. Cause it's going to be different based on where we are. So, um, now I have to figure out some new, new ideas. Okay. So, so let's talk about the menu. Bef hang on, hang on. Let's, let's, let's stop this before some of you may know Kat. Some of you may not for the first like two minutes, just explain what you do and who you are and all of that. Sure. That'd be great. Sure. So, um, I travel and I eat a lot of things <laughs> and I drink a lot of things. Um, I'm a writer, food and travel writer. Uh, I was for a very long time an editor at a publication called Eater. Um, and I switched over to freelance a few years back. So now I kind of like you know, write for a bunch of different magazines, also focus a lot on uh, like health and wellness writing. It's a topic I'm really interested in. And um, yeah, and uh, so that's pretty much food travel writer. And, uh, you know, I like to cook at home and throw things on Instagram, that kind of vibe. Yeah, your Instagram destroys me every day I wake <laughs> up and turn on. I'm like, oh my God. It's like, I live in where I'm at in the UK at the moment. It's like the middle of nowhere and restaurants are still closed down. So it's just down to me cooking every day. And I, as much as I absolutely love cooking, I'm just not the best at cooking compared <laughs> to some of the some of the chefs out there. And I'm just like so jealous of you just eating all this amazing food every day. We, yeah, we definitely eat way too much. But um, hey, how's that going? How's that like second lockdown? It's okay, to be fair. I think yeah, we're so used to it here now. Yeah. Just like the rest of the, well, not the rest of the world, but a lot of places in the world. Um it sucks for all the the restaurant industry and the kind of services industry and the entertainment industry but yeah it's what it is i think they've how long has it been how long has your second lockdown when it, did it start it's it's going to be a month in total um they're yeah. opening back up on the 2nd of december they've just Got it. literally just announced it today it was always a plan to just do a month um Got it. but i don't know i don't know how, if it's going to it's gonna work really yeah uh, I really don't know but New York is I've been hearing New York is thinking about that too doing a second shutdown I don't but it would be I think later in the winter yeah. um and, and New York just reopened yeah. I'd say like a month ago for like dine-in and it's 25 percent capacity right now so and then there's all this outdoor dining and like the joke like among everyone here and you probably have this in London too is that you can only dine outside if you're dining inside you know yeah. it's like you're, you just basically <laughs> create the same structure but outside <laughs> yeah it's kind of wild we yeah. we're we were lucky that we didn't have to do that we were kind of yeah. allowed to go back into restaurants but i That's think it was like limited kind yeah. of capacity but i i know the bar the clubs still haven't opened but i know the bars they said it was limited capacity but no one's really policing it um, right 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 so I, I don't know i hope by spring next year we're kind of back to normal and i know 
I know there's, you know, a couple promising vaccines, even though I'm personally, I will never get the vaccine, but <laughs> for other people, it's good. It's better not me. Um, but that will help, right? Help build herd immunity. It's, it's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Because so many people were like, I won't take the vaccine. Yeah. But everyone wants it to go back to normal as well. So it's like, I know. it's weird because I've, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've had it. So Oh, you did? Yeah, I got was it. it. How, how was your experience? It was it was okay. It was like yeah. lost my taste and smell, which was the worst bit, really. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I didn't feel great for, for like a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's messed up my cardio massively. But uh. it's, again, like it's not I'm, – I'm fit and healthy, so I'm all right. Yeah, so, so you're I'm, fine. I'm, I'm lucky. Um, yeah, and you feel normal now. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah. as normal as can be. So, yeah, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's talk about your menu for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, okay. So the original plan was um, Mike's dad was going to do a lot of the cooking. So I was my typical role in like family uh, dinners is to contribute like the dessert side of the menu. I'm okay. usually like the pastry chef. Okay. Um, but lately I've been doing a little more savory, but for this menu, I was going to do a salted brown butter, um, pumpkin, maple pumpkin pie. Um, so no like white sugar, or anything like that. And then I was going to do, so Alfred Portale is like one of the famous like OG chefs of New York. His, uh, first restaurant was called Gotham bar and grill, which is now closed, but he just reopened a new restaurant just opened a new restaurant like two months ago called Portale. Anyway, at his original restaurant, he had this um, chocolate tart recipe that was like one of the most famous in New York. And so it's online. You can find it super easy. It's like four ingredients, five ingredients. So I was going to make, it's like this very rich and decadent, like thin chocolate tart. Um, so I was going to make that and then probably some like vanilla bean, you know, whipped cream or vanilla ice cream, something like that on the side. So that was going to be the menu. But now that we're staying in New York, I have to change that because my parents are not big on chocolate and they like light and fresh and like fruit driven desserts. So I'm thinking maybe something with a pear. Um, I don't know. I have to figure it out today. And no, then no disrespect to your parents, but how, how are people not into chocolate? I don't know. Well, so my, <laughs> okay. My parents don't like very sweet things. Although it is the kind of situation where if I just made it, they would eat it Me and too. they would enjoy it. They just prefer more like fruit based desserts okay. as opposed to like rich chocolate. Like my mom totally loves chocolate. Like she eats pieces of chocolate, but like they'll never necessarily like order like a molten chocolate cake dessert yeah, yeah. or anything like that. They're more like, you know, hazelnut, like a nut based or, um, fruit or that, that kind of situation. Okay. So anyway, um, I don't know what I'm going to do, but probably something fruit based. I have to do two things because one is definitely not enough. And then I'm just guessing that my, my dad does like growing up, my dad did all the cooking. He's a great cook. But now that Mike is here, um, I think Mike will probably do the turkey. My dad sometimes overcooks it a little bit. Um, so we'll let Mike do that. Uh, the, the, my dad does this like um, potato recipe that I've had my whole life, which I love. And it's super simple. Basically, it's white potatoes um, that you just chop up and like douse in tons of olive oil, uh, salt and pepper and just roast in the oven until they're super crispy, like very, very simple, but super good. So like, we'll do that. And then we have to figure out like some vegetables now as well. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the general direction we're going in at the moment. In your household, is Thanksgiving a bigger, bigger food day than Christmas? No, Christmas is bigger. Is it bigger for you? Because I yeah, was literally talking to us. one of my friends from America and she was like, no, Thanksgiving's bigger to us than Christmas. Um, well, so for my family, so my family is also European. So uh, okay. I don't really celebrate everything kind of European style. Um but so like we celebrate Christmas on the 24th instead of the 25th, which is like the American way of doing it. Uh, but I did we, not know that. Yeah, like, we just, yeah, for whatever reason, we kind of are more into Christmas than Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I think my parents probably, if Mike and I weren't here, my brother's here with his girlfriend, but like, you know, because of COVID, they don't want to go to anyone's house. So yeah, they probably yeah. would have just like done something really not exciting if we weren't here is my guess. <laughs> I get that. I get that. So I want to talk about how you got into being a food writer and what kind of, yeah, what, why really? Sure. Well, 
So um, I grew up in a household that really embraces food and wine. So it was just part of my upbringing. And I was in the kitchen from a really young age cooking. My mom is from the Czech Republic. Uh, my grandmother, who is now 102, uh, she used to come to New York um, as a child when I was growing up for like, you know, four months out of the year. And she's an amazing cook. So I started cooking with her when I was like, I don't know, maybe four or five years old, like very, very young. I just, my, like, if I think back on my childhood, it was just like always surrounded by like food and cooking and kitchen. And, um, so, and then my dad is an amazing cook, but he's more of an intuitive, he doesn't follow recipes and he kind of just throws things together. But, um, I grew up eating, I did. So like, I didn't really eat American food growing up, which is like, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, chocolate chip cookies. Like I never ate these things just cause like my parents, it just was they, like, it wasn't on the radar yeah, really. Yeah. So it was like, but my dad cooked a lot of like, uh, Chinese and Malaysian and Turkish and all these different like ethnic cuisines. And so, um, well, and then that would become my leftovers when I would go to school, you know, cause I would, yeah. I, ref- I refused to eat the food in the school. Cause it was disgusting, like refuse. I wouldn't do it. So my parents would have to make me like a complicated lunch every day, <laughs> but it would be like, it would be like this, like really stinky garlicky pesto with pasta from the night before. And then I would always be the kid with like the super smelly, like garlicky lunch or something, but it tasted good. <laughs> but I, so but nice. I, but I was like, Oh God, it's like always me when there's like something weird <laughs> happening in my lunch. Um, the boys loved your breath. Yeah. The boys loved your breath throughout the whole of oh, school. Oh God. Killed it. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just kind of something I grew up around. And then I, food, so food and fashion have always been my biggest interest. I ended up working like as an internship when I was in high school for Cosmopolitan magazine, like yeah. fashion mag. And then um, just decided it wasn't like, I love clothing and aesthetic and design, but um, I decided it, it was I decided my focus was more on food. So, um, and then I was thinking I wanted to be the New York times food critic at one point, And then I wanted to open a restaurant. This is all before I was 20. And then, uh, after college, I ended up getting hired by Bon Appetit, which is a big mag here. I'm not yeah. sure if it's in the UK. It might yeah. be. I think it is. Um, yeah. Uh, so that was my, pretty much my first job out of college. I moved to Los Angeles for that job they were based in LA and I was there for a couple of years. I was there for two years. And then I pretty much got hired by eater, like, very early on. And I started, uh, at a really, I was like 25, really young, not, didn't have any experience as an editor. Yeah. Um, but they hired me to run Eater LA. So I did that for five years and then moved back to New York to do other things with the company. So yeah, I've always just kind of done the same thing, which is eat and then write about what I'm eating. <laughs> so would you class yourself as like a critic or would you, are you like more so are you like one of those people that like will talk shit on a, on a, on a restaurant if it's bad or are you gonna Um, like be nice (laughs) so my approach is if i don't like a restaurant i'm just not gonna write about it yeah like that's my feeling if it's bad i'm not gonna cover it it's not worth my time um i don't i'm not i mean i'm i am very as a as a human i'm very critical of food like especially when i'm dining out whoever i'm sitting with um but I'm not, you know, my, my job isn't to be a critic. I'm not a critical writer. I'm yeah. more of, I cover like trends and basically I like to find new, cool, interesting things. It can be a new restaurant. It can be a specific dish. It can be a technique. It can be an ingredient. And then I get excited about finding that unique thing and then telling people about it. And I try to do that through my writing. And then I try to do that through Instagram as well. So where are you, where, where are you based now? Well, nowhere. <laughs> so um, Mike and I have been living internationally for the last um, two and a half years without any residence at all. So we've been traveling a lot through Asia. We've been in London a bunch uh, for a project he was doing there. Uh, lots of time in Asia. We were So then th- for the first six months of this year, we were in Mexico in Tulum, living in the jungle on a different restaurant project. But, and so originally our plan was we're going to open a restaurant. Yeah. Um, the plan was to go to Los Angeles and open in LA, but we literally decided about three weeks ago to not do that. It's just Fuck California. so many plot problems in California. Now everyone's leaving. It just didn't seem like a smart decision. So we're going to do Brooklyn instead. Um, we're in the process. We found an amazing apartment. So we're um, in the process of actually like finalizing that lease right now and hopefully move in December 31st. So we will be living in New York in like a month and a half, That's amazing. <laughs> but we're still homeless, which is why we're in the Hamptons right now at my family's house. <laughs> Whereabouts in Brooklyn? Um, it's in Dumbo. Okay, cool. I used to live yeah. in Williamsburg. Um, oh, nice. Of course I did. 
Um, <laughs> the, uh, probably four years ago. Literally, I okay. was there when actually when Trump got elected. Like that, oh, God. that time, it was a strange time. Um, oh my God, totally. But Brooklyn or New York is probably my favorite city in the world. Yeah. Um, like there's other cities I prefer going to. But mm-hmm. when I, it's almost, it's weird. When I land in New York, I'm like, this is my home. Like, it's just yeah. oh, weird, nice. just weird feeling. Um, that's awesome. But also the food in New York is just on another level. Yeah. There is great food in New York. And I mean, also the convenience of being able to order like anything you want at like four o'clock in the morning is pretty amazing too. It's something I took for granted. And then I moved to Los Angeles and I was like, wait, there's no food. Del- this is like a while ago, but there was like, <laughs> You know, no Uber Eats at that time. Yeah. There was nothing. You couldn't really order delivery. And I was like, what is going <laughs> on here? You can't order food to go? I remember but- I remember going to New York when I was, uh, I think, 20. Uh, I stayed one of my friends. She lived in Little Italy. And I'd, I'd been to America, but not as like an adult, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I went with my family when I was younger. And in the UK, especially, I live in the sticks, so we don't have delivery services at all delivery services was never big in the uk up until maybe a few years ago yeah um and it was only in the major cities that you'd get that so coming to new york and like yeah being able to get any cuisine at any time of the day it was kind of like mind-blowing to me and i I, even when i go to america i still can't bring myself to order food at like four o'clock in the morning because I'm just like this <laughs> just isn't right I just don't know how this is physically possible it's just not right but there is something about New York that's just it's just a beautiful city for everything um, yeah I, I, I mean it offers so much there's culture there's sophistication there's the arts there's I mean yeah New York New York has a lot going on for sure so what type of restaurant are you guys open in? So we right now are playing with this idea of a sort of a dual concept. So there would be a really high end, like 16 seat omakase style counter um, and then something more accessible on the ground floor. But this whole uh, the concept is really embracing the idea that food is medicine. So it's something that is really important to me and is really important to Mike um, using inspiration from uh, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine. Basically, we both feel like, I think for Mike, he thinks a lot about the future of food. What does that mean? And it's not, in our opinion, it's not progression. It's not like geeky, get like a kind of like a molecular, this term molecular cuisine that we have. Yeah. We don't think that's the future. We think the future is creating delicious food that's really beautiful, that's three Michelin, but that's actually good for you. Yeah. And I think from dining at so many tasting menus, you know, most of the time you leave feeling so disgustingly full. Um, You know, it even has repercussions the next day and we kind of want to change that. So whether it's through botanicals, through adaptogenic ingredients, through the specific way ingredients are combined, we want to create, let's say, let's say the, let's say the way that I like to explain this to friends is let's say you have an eight course menu and it's $350 you have two options for this eight course menu. One leaves your body in a better place than when you sat down and the other doesn't. And they're both equally as delicious. You know, why wouldn't you take that, that menu? So that's sort of the idea that we're looking to execute, you know, like on a three Michelin level, and then also very technique driven, but a little bit more relaxed and not tasting menu on the ground floor. Okay. Kind of the plan. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you, have you ever done a restaurant yourself before? No, no, I have not. So I, um, Mike is your husband as well, right? Yeah, we actually just got married like two days ago. Oh, no way. Congratulations. Well, I mean, well, no, so <laughs> we were supposed to get married in Mexico um, like a week ago, but obviously we canceled that a lot, like a big wedding, you know, like yeah, we canceled yeah. that like, you know, six months ago, eight months ago. So that was done. So then we were just like, we still want to do that. We still want to have a proper wedding, but we can't plan anything because of COVID. Yeah. So we're just like, ah, eh, we'll just like go to the courthouse and like do something really simple and then have a big like party still next year whenever we can. So we just did that. It was like very, it was just my parents and my brother um, and his girlfriend, six people like oh, signed some paperwork and that was it. You know, That's it was like amazing. not, it was just, yeah, really simple. So is Mike a chef? So Mike is a chef. Um, he was the executive chef of a very famous restaurant in Chicago called Alinea. Oh, okay. um, three Michelin. So he was the executive chef there. What's for his eight name? Years. What's his surname? Uh, 
Mike Bagel. Ah, I've got his Instagram up now. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. okay, this makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So he's known for like really uh, progressive food and innovating and creating yeah. techniques that don't exist. So we want to apply that similar philosophy, but to like a really clean eats approach, but like in a way that you don't know you're eating healthy food. Like there's not, no one's going to tell you what you're eating is crazy, crazy healthy, unless you like read an article about the restaurant and they're explaining yeah. that philosophy, yeah, yeah. but it's not like anything. You're not going to know that necessarily just going to the restaurant. It's just going to be delicious. I love that. You, and you'll leave feeling better. Cause did you write a book on healthy eating? I did. I did. I, I wrote a book called unicorn food. That was my second was book. It. Um, the first one was a cocktail book called day drinking. So unicorn food was inspired by um, my travels and ingredients that I encountered in different countries. Cause I've been traveling pretty aggressively uh, for uh, like 10, 12 years now yeah. um, all over. And so it was, in, it's a plant-based cookbook. So there's no animal products in there, but I believe that it's really easy to eat clean and healthy um, without animal products. And you can make that kind of food delicious. You just have to have like a little bit of technique. You just have to have, you just have to know how to do it. Yeah. So that was, so that was inspired by um, also like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine and, um, and also uh, foods that are naturally huge. So a lot of the recipes are really vibrant and colorful. And that's based around the idea that those foods are much higher in antioxidants than white foods. Okay. So yeah, so that was, um, that came out about a year and a half ago. Interesting. So what, where was the interest in like Chinese medicine and kind of everything sure. that came from? So I moved to LA and um, lo the Los Angeles dining scene is so different as compared to New York. <laughs> and there's a lot of like, you know, clean food there. And I just, it all sort of started, well, I was living in LA and I started making these um, like almond milk, like my own almond milk, things like that. And then I loved I, I got really into like the healthy food movement living in LA. And then when I came back to New York, which was in 2014, I just didn't have access to all this stuff yeah. that I had access to in LA. And so I just figured, okay, well, I'll just make it all myself. And so originally I had this idea to start, this is also before now there's a lot of like alternative dairy, milk, like plant-based milks, but this was like before there was anything on the market. I was like, I want to start a, um, like a plant-based uh, milk line. So I was using like a lot of almonds, but I did like cashew, coconut, goji. I had like this whole line of milks that I'd created and they were in this like rainbow of colors. And so I was working with my brother actually to create this like product called unicorn milk. Okay. Um, and then that sort of turned into, I, with my original book, when I wrote my first book, I had mentioned unicorn food to my um, editor at my publisher. And she's like, oh my God, that's a book. We, should, we need to make that as your second book. So the idea of that cookbook, Unicorn Food, stemmed from this line of milks that I wanted to create. And for me, it's just, I've eaten so much restaurant food um, for a very long time. When I lived in LA, when I was running Eater, I mean, I dined out six nights a week. I was always in a restaurant. I was always eating restaurant food, but coming back to New York, I did do that still, but I cut out white sugar from my diet. I cut out a lot of things and not for any reason other than I felt better. I didn't yeah. have any allergies. I didn't have any, um, you know, I, there was no other reason. I just wanted to do it for myself. Yeah. And I realized that, um, I just noticed that I felt so much healthier and better. And I started taking, I mean, I have like, even in my room here right now, I have like this crazy apothecary of like ingredients and <laughs> so much stuff. It actually stresses me out sometimes, <laughs> but um, like different like collagens and that's vitamin some, A. That's and some witch shit going on there. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but, but so for me, I, I've really noticed a difference in when I'm at, ho at home and I can, well, home and I can have like my access to all of these, ingredients and I have this like routine versus when I go on these like crazy travel binges where for a few weeks like if I go to Tokyo it's like oh my god like two tasting menus a day like blah 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 and actually Tokyo is a bad example because I feel better in Tokyo than I do like in let's say Paris Paris is like a nightmare Tokyo is but amazing. um Tokyo, the food. like two days in Paris I'm like oh my god I'm gonna <laughs> die <Or the> <laughs> um but I've I just really feel a difference for myself um and it also keeps my immunity really high. I really don't get sick very that's often right. ever. Yeah. So that's cool. I've never, yeah. I, I didn't really know that much about you where it comes to like, you, you're very into like Chinese medicine and kind of yeah. things like that. Easily. Yeah, totally. Um, Let's go back to Tokyo. Tokyo is one of my favorite places. 
Oh, Tokyo <laughs> is my favorite city in the world. And I miss it so much. Oh my God, so much. So we had like this literally like three week trip planned. We were supposed to fly there on Saturday, this coming Saturday, and obviously had to cancel it because of COVID and had like legit the sickest lineup of restaurants, oh. like restaurants that nobody gets into. And I don't even know if I can ever get into them again. Like insane list. How do you get in them? Is it just the fact that you're a, a famous food food writer and your husband's I mean, a famous chef? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I've made, fr- I mean, I've been to Tokyo so many times. I mean, I was averaging, I've been averaging like four times a year for oh. a number of years now. So I have a lot of friends there, uh, chefs, and so they can help out with like making reservations. Yeah. There are some platforms that I do think do a pretty decent job of booking. You just kind of have to like Tabalog and Omakase and Pocket Concierge, but you have to sort of um, like set, because those reservations that they put, if it's for top spaces, like disappear in a second. So you have to like set a notification for a certain day or time and it'll ping you. You'll get an email and you need to jump on and book Straight it like away. within a second. And yeah. you can get into some of those space places. It's a little bit annoying because they charge, I think, a little bit of um, like a service fee. But still, it's like for a lot of Americans or people that don't have like any hookups, you know, that's can be one of the ways, like only ways to get in. Yeah, every so, time I've been there is I I've just been playing a show there or something, and yeah. the promoters kind of always look after you, so they take you to okay. these amazing places. And like, I just love the fact that you can you can be walking for miles, and then they like take you up a side street, and then that leads to another side street, and then another side street, and then you're like yeah. in this most amazing ramen shop that like oh has like three seats and like they just do this like the most amazing ramen or like the most amazing wagyu like it's literally just wagyu steak they do like one thing but they do it so perfectly yep and you're just like it's just the culture right that they're, they're it's the culture. perfect and there's you know like they have a word for this in japanese and it's shokunin and shokunin mm. means craftsman so shokunin is not a sushi uh sorry shokunin would not apply to like a kaiseki chef but it would apply to a sushi chef or somebody that like does yakiniku with wagyu so shokunin is craftsman but it's for one specific craft okay. so it could be somebody that makes furniture somebody that dyes cloth somebody that does a singular thing um and it's a really unique part of the Japanese culture. And you have like that movie, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, if you've seen that as a great example, yeah. because you have one person who does a singular craft and wants to perfect that craft. And over the course of their life, he, she does that. And then they become a master, you know, later on in life. And they're super well-respected. Um, but yeah, the Japanese just culturally, they strive to master dis- disciplines or crafts. And I think that's why... You know, everything in Japan is better than everywhere else. It's so it's good. Like, right? It's like, just like beautifully packaged. Like everything is perfect. It's just like, oh my God. Even when you go, go to like the, to like one of the department stores, you go to B1 or anywhere, go shopping. They give you, and it's raining outside. I love, I love this. You know, they give you a shopping bag and then they put the, the like a raincoat over the shopping bag. Like who the hell else is going to do that? Nobody. The food, Nobody's giving you a raincoat for your shopping bag. The food in 7-Eleven is like better than su- most restaurants in America. And oh, there's no totally. disrespect. And, it's just and, amazing. And you can also get like, if you go to Family Mart or 7-Eleven, they have like the perfect crystal clear blocks of ice yeah oh <laughs> dreams oh my god if i could go to like a 7-eleven here and get that yeah apart from here you go to, or in america you, we don't have 7-elevens in the uk yeah. but you, you go to the 7-eleven in america and it just smells of the pizza and the hot dogs oh god, it's just it's like so disgusting, disgusting. It's like old oil it's so oh, gross. it's awful it's awful oh. so okay tokyo is one of your favorite places to go yeah um oh, what's one of your favorite cuisines to eat though like because like Japanese, okay, tell yeah. me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And this sounds cliche as fuck, but <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of sushi. All right? really? I'm, I'm really just, I just didn't, don't get it. Okay? okay. I really don't get it. I think it, for me, it just feels like it's more of a fashion thing okay. than uh, this is unbelievably tasty food have you have you gone to like some of the top top places in an in america no but i've been to i can't remember the name of the place in yeah. in, in tokyo that i went to but yeah. it, that was unbelievable i was like yeah. 
it was what it was my first night there I'd ever been, and they took me to the sushi place. They were like, I was like, I don't really like seafood. I'm not a huge seafood fan. Yeah. And they're like, we're taking you anyway. So I went, yeah. I ate it, and it was great. Yeah. But sushi everywhere else in the world that I've had it, I'm just never like, it's just not that great. Yeah. So a lot of that comes down to the technique. So I'm a terrible sushi snob. So for me, I almost don't want to eat sushi if I'm not in Tokyo because it's yeah. not worth it. Yeah. I sort of feel the same way as you. Um, there are, you know, there like New York has some high end places. It's pretty expensive and they do a pretty good job, but there's nothing like dining in Tokyo. And most of the sushi that exists is shit. It yeah. is, you know, the fish isn't good quality. The rice isn't good quality. It's yeah. not properly seasoned. Like the whole idea with with sushi is to build umami in your ingredients. And that's through different curing processes. That's through having really high quality fish, aging the fish certain amounts of time, seasoning your rice in a very specific way. And most people don't do it properly, which is why I don't really eat it um, unless it's like a really, really good place. I don't think it's worth it. No, I agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you agree with me on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's really not worth it otherwise. California and, yeah, rolls. Places, like, yeah, in Make New York, it's, you know, you have to spend at least like a couple hundred dollars to get like a good good version of that which i'm fine with spending money on food yeah. but i'd rather spend 500 to a thousand bucks on a flight to tokyo and eat amazing food there than oh, spend 200 sure. bucks on a, a night in new york yeah. with something that totally. yeah i don't know yeah yeah of course definitely so tokyo always wins <laughs> it does always so japanese japanese food is your favorite cuisine it is and that spans the gamut um like, so when we go to Japan, we basically bring an extra piece of luggage just to buy ingredients. Really? So our kitchen is like all Asian. Like we pretty much only eat Asian at home. We don't really cook like American food, really. Um, we have so many different like soy sauces and vinegars and all this stuff that we've brought back from Asia uh, that like everything we cook has like an Asian touch. We've been really into Sichuan recently and really into like a lot of um kind of Chinese style cooking, but, uh, yeah, Japanese is definitely, definitely number one. Obviously in Tokyo, there's just so many genres, right? You can do ramen, you can do yakiniku, like wagyu, you can do sushi, you can do soba, like there's just udon, just go like on and on and on, kaiseki, kapo. So we like to, when we go, we try to plan it out. So we're doing like some yakitori, some of this, some of that. We kind of like, you know, touch on all the different cuisines. And I think that Tokyo is like one of the few places I, I love Copenhagen too, but Tokyo is one of the few places where I go there and I never get sick of the food. Yeah. It's just, there's just so much there as well. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah, all, yeah, yeah. It, it's all different, but all, all so good. I actually remember yeah. it somewhere in Tokyo. I can't remember. I can't, I'm, I can't speak Japanese, <laughs> so I can't tell you where it was and, and what it, what it yeah, was called, totally. but it was an udon restaurant. We, we wait, we waited like an hour to get in there. Um, and literally it was, um, just nood udon noodles with, uh, egg, deep, fry yeah. deep fried egg, tamp tampura egg. Yeah, and it yeah, was yeah. so good. There was like nothing else with it. No sauce. No and I was just like, how can they make these udon noodles taste so good? And the egg tastes so good. And that's all it is. There's no broth, nothing. I know, right? It's like, it's so outrageous. And also the thing that I've learned with Japan, the very first time I was in Tokyo a long time ago, I remember being in Ginza and I saw like a bakery with, I think what was, they were just selling milk bread and there was like 30 people queued up to get in. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Who's waiting in line for yeah. a piece of bread? This is ridiculous. Now I am the person where I'm like, if you see a line, get in the line. Cause there's something amazing at the end of that line. Just do it. <laughs> I will get in the line for food, especially ramen in Tokyo. <laughs> you have to, right? You have, you have to. to. It's it, just like how it works it's, there. It's strange. One of my good friends out there called Daruma, uh, he is, he's like in, he's a DJ, but he's also uh, has like a really big fashion label out there called uh, Full Full Blank. Okay. Um, And e even like the t-shirts that they make, like I wear them and I'm like, there's nothing else that feels this good. Like you yeah. could buy like, the, the most high-end t-shirt from an American or Italian brand or sure. something like that. Yeah. And this is just like a normal t-shirt that normal people wear. And it's just, is so much better made. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah. how, how is this culture? Like considering the culture is still young in, in the grand, like from how they were to how they are now, like they've 
been through a lot of shit over the years and they've done a lot of shit. But the culture's just kind of evolved into this amazing thing. And you're just like, oh, have you done any, so have, have you been to any sumo wrestling? No, but we were going to do that. Um, when was that? We were going to do that. No, but I have not. Have you? No, I, I saw a sumo wrestler in the street though and stalked him for a while. Oh my God, um, that's amazing. But I, when I went, it was out of season. I was actually there like a year ago now. Um, oh yeah, that's actually when I was there too. Yeah, last. it's like out of season and yeah, I really want to go. I really want. I do too. That's definitely. I also really wanted to go to that like robot show. I think it's in. Oh, what's that? Shibuya. So they do these like laser light shows, but it's like people dressed as robots, and there's it's like a whole like (laughs) thing. I think if you Google like robot show Tokyo, it'll pop up, but it looks like crazy, but like so Japanese, and like one of those things you just have to just like you're not going to experience this anywhere else. That's amazing. Have you done the uh, (laughs) Have you done the go karts, the Mario karts? No, (laughs) but I've seen it so many times. It's hilarious. I love. Great. It's great for the Instagram. It's so, so funny. Good. Yeah, I need to do that next time. Yeah. And like people are, yeah, people get dressed up like the characters, like yeah. the Mario characters. I love it. It's so good. So I discovered you on, I think it was the meat show on Eater. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nick. Nick is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Um, that show is kind of wild because also he just eats meat, which I'm like a huge meat lover. Um, yeah. What, with like when you were working at Eater, how like what was your full role in that like wh- how did that come across and like wh- what were you doing there yeah so originally i was hired as the editor of the los angeles site so i did that for five years um which was basically as a city editor you're just like tracking the news you know cover making sure you know everything that's happening in your city with regard to like food and bev and then um they wanted me to come back to new york so i ended up coming back to new york to host um like a show. So that was right around, that was right after Eater was bought by Vox, which is like a really big media company and very video driven. So I started this show that I was hosting called Consumed, where I was um, basically going around the city and finding like cool thing, kind of like what I said to you before, which is like a cool dish or like a cool technique or Like we did a matcha segment. We did some sushi segments. I did a lot of sushi just, or like Japanese leaning just because that's my own interest. I think I watched, is that on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've I've pretty much watched all of them. (laughs) Oh, awesome, (laughs) awesome. (laughs) Awesome, that's great. Yeah, I did like, I was psyched because I did the first ever um, interview with Masa Takayama from Masa in New York. And that was like wildly successful. Uh, But anyway, so then I was doing my show and then Nick had a show called The Meat Show. So we decided to like, so I did a couple like celebrity things. Um, I did something with Elijah Wood at a sushi place in LA. I did something with Casey Neistat. Like they, they started like pe- peppering like my show with like random yeah. like so, so, pseudo celebs, known, known people. And then they wanted me to do some stuff with Nick's. We're like already friends. And I had this idea to do, I think it was, um, so Angie Marr, who's the chef and owner of a place, uh, in the West village, or I think it's moving now, but it has been in the West village called the Beatrice Inn. So she did this really freaking amazing six month piece of dry aged beef. And it was like bananas. Um, She trained with a famous butcher in Paris. She did this like whole whiskey bandage wrapped thing. And I've had it two or three times and it is absolutely insanely amazing. Was that the JD one? Is it what? Was that the J the one that's that's, uh, dry aged in in Jack Daniels? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So Nick and I shot an episode there together and it was just like that piece of meat is, <laughs> I am at a loss for words. It's so phenomenal. It's, it's, it's so rich though, that you really can't eat very much of it. It's, it's kind of even richer than Wagyu. It's just the flavor and, but anyway, it's amazing. So then, yeah, so Nick and I kind of started teaming up and we shot some episodes together. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool show. I like, I like watching food shows generally. Yeah. Um, for me, it's just like. It's just an escapism for me where I can just like imagine I'm in a restaurant and eating good food right now because I'm not. Especially when you're <laughs> quarantined, right? And you can't. Yeah. When we were in Mexico, we were like, we need shows about Tokyo. We want to watch Tokyo food videos. We like couldn't find anything on Netflix. Just Why like, don't you do it when you go there? I know. I I actually have pitched that before to a production company to do like have a show idea. <laughs> you should do it yourself. <laughs> I know it's true. You're freelance. So, okay, let's talk about being freelance. 
<laughs> how much better is it being freelance than not? Or what's the pros and cons? Um, it's pretty amazing. I love it. Um, so I'm lucky in that I, for like most of my career, I've always worked from home just because Eater never had offices in LA. Uh, when I came back to New York, I worked in the office two days a week, but I am definitely not an office person. And I'm also not like a strict schedule nine to five person. I prefer to like work on my own time. And, yeah. um, so I know a lot of people have trouble with being at home and working from home and it's like distracting or but I, I don't feel that way just because I've always done it. Freelance is great. I mean, it's, uh, it gives you so much freedom. You can travel when you want. It's a slightly, you know, it's, it's a different hustle because you're not like getting a steady paycheck. It's like, you know, totally. per project, yeah. but um, overall, I think it's great. And what I like about it as a writer specifically is that in the past I could only write for an eater audience and I could only write for, really about topics that the eater audience would want yeah. to hear about. So like the health and wellness didn't really fit in as much. And also back then eater didn't have any like real travel focus. Now there is a travel site. So be at, like for me, I can now pitch to like all these different publications to newspapers and basically just kind of open up the scope of what I'm writing about and write in a slightly different voice than I have in the past. So it's definitely overall just like a lot more freedom. Yeah, I get that. And yeah, totally. So if you, or when you guys open up your own restaurant, what's your, what's your role going to be in that? Um, I think I'm probably going to be a little bit more behind the scenes. Like definitely I'm, I'm very, uh, design focused. So I want to be a big part of the aesthetic, but also crafting the beverage program, the wine list, um, hi, like hiring people. And I think I'll probably do a lot of like feel just cause my, my background is media driven. So, um, probably help out on the PR side, yeah. like fielding yeah. responses and figuring out how to respond and who we want to like work with on stories, things like that. We were one of my good friends in LA is a publicist and she's, um, one of the best PR people I've ever worked with. And she's really small and boutique. So I want her to hopefully do this. She was going to do the Mexico project. So I want her to do this one as well. So, yeah. and we work really well together. So I think my role will be a little bit more like behind the scenes. That sounds amazing. That sounds yeah. I, when when it's open, let me know because I'm definitely Yeah, oh my go. god, of course. Yeah, you'll have go. to come. We're looking at probably like 18 months. It um, takes so ages. it's gonna be pretty big. One of my friends has big. just opened a pop up in uh Portland. Oh um, cool. Which one? Oh my god, what's it called? <laughs> let me find that out. It's, Gre it's Gregory, Gregory Gordet's um okay. place. Portland's cool. Uh called Khan. Yeah, Khan, K A N N. Ah, oh, okay. What's the style of food? It's Cajun. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, he's like an insane chef. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, he's been talking about this. No, it's not Cajun. It's Haitian. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Even more interesting. Um, but New York food. What's your favorite restaurant in New York? I know it's a cliche question. Um, well, I would say probably, well, okay. For like more high end sushi Nas, which is the best sushi in the city. Yeah. Um, and then I'm obsessed in Williamsburg with four horsemen. So like the wine list, I'm also really, really into wine. Um, the wine list there is pretty epic. Like it's, and it's all natural wine. See, I don't drink. And no. I wish I did drink because I wish <laughs> I liked, I I don't drink because I don't like it. That's pretty much yeah, the yeah, only yeah, reason why yeah, I don't yeah. drink. And wine is just something that I'd absolutely love to get into. Yeah. But I just can't do it. No, not, not into it. I just can't do it at all. It's just yeah. like. You know what? It's, it's, it's healthier. <laughs> it's healthier True. to not drink. <laughs> Way healthier. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Four Horsemen has like, um. It was, it's founded by one of the guys in LCD sound system. Um, and then he has, he's one of three guys, one of four guys in the project. And they also have, it's sort of like a wine bar, um, very simple, but the food is just, it's just great. It's just really well done. Very, very simple, excellent ingredients. And then this like epic wine list. It reminded me of um, uh, Floor in like the bottom wine bar area of Floor in London, if you've okay. been there. No, I've not been there. Yeah. It's a... Uh, and it's kind of like globally influenced, but um, they got one Michelin star last year. It's super simple and like very delicious. How hard is it to get a Michelin star, honestly? Because I feel like in the, re like, I'm very naive in the sure. restaurant world. Well, but the, in my opinion, the truth of the matter is depends what city you're in. Yeah. I think like, for example, Hong Kong, it's super easy to get stars. Really easy. The I think the Michelin rankings in Hong Kong are like 
ridiculous and make no sense at all yeah. and are terrible. I've eaten at like a bunch of three star places that are just are like, are you joking? Like, no <laughs> way. Like, no. New York is more competitive. Um, and obviously Paris is Paris is I mean, France in general is probably the most competitive for yeah. stars. But I think in also like the Chicago star rankings, I lived in Chicago for a year was like very strange and also didn't make sense. I think in like the 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 sort of like more obscure cities, they're from in my opinion, just like not as accurate. Yeah. New York is pretty good. Um and you know, you definitely need to have skill to get a star in, in most of the time. Yeah. Um, and it's a general it's a good general barometer for restaurant quality, but I would say there are times when it's not reliable. Is there is there anything else in the restaurant world that isn't michelin star that's more like in the industry that people look up to it as like yeah that's that's more important than a michelin star um i mean there's like world's 50 best yeah. you know there's that there's this newer thing called oad actually they do it in london okay uh opinionated about dining which is just like a lot of people some people in the industry some people not that are just like huge diners and like travel and eat yeah. forever and ever and ever um, I'm in this, like, I don't even know how I got into this, like, Facebook group called uh, Itinerary. And it's just, like, literally a bunch of people who spend their life traveling around the world and eating. So a lot of people from that Facebook group are, it's, like, 200 people are in, like, part of OAD and do this ranking system. But, yeah, there isn't, I guess Michelin is probably the best, One, I think, yeah. the best ranking system. And also the most, um, like, widespread except for Australia. I don't think Michelin's in Australia. They use like the hat system. <laughs> I don't know much about Typical it, but it's, it's so silly. It's like hats. You get like one hat, you get two hats. Sure. <laughs> uh, have you, have you been to Gargans? No. Where is that? Singapore. No, I haven't. It's, mm -mm. It's, but I was in Singapore a year ago. It's Indian cuisine. I think it's in Singapore. Okay. It, Indian's my favorite cuisine. Um, Ooh, I, awesome like, i love indian obviously being from the uk it's very it's yeah very, it's kind of we we it's very british if that makes sense it's all we kind of eat a lot of us totally uh, what's what's your favorite in london for indian uh, there's a place called gunpowder oh i went there i think i think i went there maybe i didn't I know the name for sure. It's really, I was literally there a couple of, when we, when the lockdown kind of opened here, the restaurants were back open and I went there, I was in a studio session in Tower Bridge and I went there like three nights in a row. It was just unbelievable. Damn. <laughs> I've, I've been to Dishoom, which is really good. Have you, I'm sure you've I've been, been there. Oh no, we were going to go actually. That was also on my radar, but we didn't end up going. Dishoom's really good, but it can't, for me, it kind of just feels like it's gone a bit too chainy. It's like, mm, yeah. there's a lot more of them now, which I get. And I'm, I respect for them for like making a shit ton of money and being successful, totally. but it's not really my vibe. Gunpowder's a lot more like, more fine dining, as fine dining as Indian cuisine can be at sure. this moment in time. Um, but Gargan's, is somewhere somewhere that I've wanted to go for so long. It's a, it's pretty much an Indian taster menu, um, huh. and it's like I think he he got number one in Asia, 50, 50 best in Asia. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm gonna look that up. He's like his stuff. Oh oh oh! You're talking about Gagan? Yeah, Gagan. I'm probably just. So Gagan right. is in Bangkok. Is it in Bangkok? So so Gagan, yeah. So he, I've been there. So he closed his, so what happened was he had like a big falling out with his like principal investor like three years ago. Ah. So he closed his original location, um, which is like the one where he, he became number one in Asia. And then um, he reopened, I think within the last year, but I haven't been to the new location. Is it in Bangkok then still? Yeah, he's in Bangkok. Why did I think it was in Singapore? Um, I don't know. I don't know. But is yeah, it, he's in Bangkok. Is it good? Ah, oh, no. It's not my favorite. <laughs> like, here's the thing. It's, it's, it's really gimmicky food and yeah. I don't like gimmicky food. Okay. Like, that's not my thing. I like really amazing ingredients and like a focus on flavor. And also a lot of dishes were like stolen from other restaurants. <sighs> you just destroyed so, my dreams. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's not my thing. It's just like trying really hard and it's just like, uh, 
but that's just my opinion. That's just not. No, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I'm really tough on restaurants in general. So, okay. Best ramen in New York. Go. Um, so, okay. Best ramen in New York. I'm not sure if it's on the menu right now, but there's a restaurant on 54th. It's actually one of my favorite restaurants in all of the city. It's Yakitori. Okay. I so think I've been there. the chef is this guy, Ikeda son. Love him. He's amazing. Um, his yakitori is excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah. He sources the, his chicken from this like tiny little farm, gets like a special bird from them. Um, and he, so basically the restaurant is kind of long and there's a rear counter where it's kind of like a U shaped. So you sit around, there's, there's chefs cooking over the grill, you know, you passing you skewers if you're sitting at the counter. And then he has this tiny little middle counter, which he can't open right now because of COVID, but it's six seats. And it's like where he does his special tasting menu. Now you have to go Mondays, or sorry, Wednesdays or Saturdays, because he only works two days a week. Okay. And he does the most insane yakitori tasting menu. And so part of that tasting menu, you have an option to get either um, like a chick, like a rice dish, some type of like chicken rice or whatever he does, or um, a noodle dish, which is a ramen he makes. And it is absolutely incredible and it is like the secret thing in new york that not that many people know about some people do that go to that are really into japanese food and go there but for me it's a i think he does like a tonkatsu like a pork pork broth but um his ramen oh no he has two two ramen sorry he does have one of those and then he has tukemen which is the dip ramen i have some photos on my instagram but for me that is the best ramen in all of new york and it's like a secret thing i get i haven't been there and i'm gonna have to check yeah. it out um, it's amazing. Do you have a favorite ramen in New York? I do. And it's probably cliche and you're probably going to be like, you're probably going to like. Which one? Ipoto? <laughs> no, it's, it's Ivan ramen. Oh, it's... Ivan. Okay. Yeah. I haven't been there in forever. Um, it was good when I went like a long time ago, but yeah, I have not. There's so much ramen in, in New York yeah. now. It's like crazy. And you have all these like famous places from Tokyo that are opening in the city. Yeah. There's so many choices. Yeah. I, I There's something about the Ivan ramen that I really like. I don't know yeah. why it's. It's not traditional, and I kind of like yeah. that, that it's not traditional, totally. kind of, but it is really good. Um, yeah, 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 totally, totally. Okay, Peter oh, Luger's. Great. Not not, not a fan. I mean, okay, so the quality of the food I don't think is great, but um, the atmosphere is amazing. Like, I love restaurants in New York that have this ability to transport you to, like, another era. Yeah, um, And totally. Peter Luger's does that really, really, really well. It's super sticky. Like, people are, like, the servers are kind of rude. And, like, I love it. I love that. You know, and it. I love that yeah. part of it. And it's so busy. You can't even like get in. Like it's, you have to like squeeze past people to get to your table. Cause yeah, it's so busy. Yeah. But like, if you're strictly talking about great steak, I don't think it's great for steak. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think the food in general is very good there. No, I, I kind of agree with you on that. Like the steak is, if you're not a massive steak eater and you go to Peter Luger's, you're going to think you've had an amazing steak because right. you're told you yeah. have to, right? It's, you're told right. that that's what it is. Um, right. Same with like the burger there. If if you're not a huge into eating amazing burgers, you're, you're, totally. you're, you're going to get that. But totally. that's the hype, right? You're kind it, of, that's exactly. You're kind yeah. of going to get it. That's okay. Exactly. You, you might be biased on this. I haven't eaten in a linear. Um, yeah. How good is it? Well, I'm going to, so I've eaten there many times, but I always ate there when Mike was the chef. So yeah. I'm going to, I can only speak to how it was back then. Of course. Um, yeah. It was amazing. I mean, it's a really special place. It was a really special place. Um, just because Mike is so incredibly creative yeah. and he's also super driven and a total perfectionist. So he was just create I mean he creates things that don't exist so he yeah. creates like technique and um he's really experimental in the kitchen and so he's always pushing himself to do something I mean he invented the balloon which is yeah. like the most famous thing that they still serve there and he had like these crystal clear he did like a crystal clear um chocolate like ice cream dish which was like a distillation of chocolate so it looked like a scoop of ice but it was chocolate it tasted like chocolate That's like wild. all sorts of crazy shit I don't you know if, in my opinion, the restaurant has completely changed since then. I don't think you see yeah. any of that creativity anymore. But back then, it was pretty, pretty awesome and pretty excellent. And I think what that restaurant has done really well is as a diner, when you walk in, it's the element of surprise and knowing that you will be surprised. That's so exciting. You just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's a really important um, 
you know, just a really important part of the experience that makes it such a special experience. Do you think in like a restaurant's life, there comes a point when you kind of have to just close doors because you've done what you've done? Or do you think that the, that there is a point where you need to bring fresh blood in to keep it going and keep it going as good as it was when it first started? I think if you're a great chef, you're able to innovate and you're able to keep up with the times and still remain you know, relevant while still sticking to your core philosophy. And if you can do that, you will continue to be successful indefinitely. Um, or if you create a super classic concept like Peter Luger, that doesn't need to change, right? Yeah. Steak is, everyone's going to always want some dry aged beef. Like yeah. that's, that is what it is. It's a classic, classic, classic spot. But if you're not doing one of those, you've got to be able to, um, to continue to reinvent your concept in a way that's, that's relevant and that makes people care about it. And if you can't do that, you close. I guess the thing is, is also in restaurants when restaurants get extremely popular and the chefs become extremely famous, it's not just, you're not just a chef. You're yeah. not just cooking food. You you have yeah. this expectation. It's the same in anything. It's the same in, in music, right? For me, it's like totally. somebody writes a number one record and then everyone expects you to always be that number one artist. And the minute you're not, it's game over. Is that the same in, yeah. in, in the food industry? I think to a certain extent it is. I mean, you're only as good as the last dish you've served. And, totally. you know, the I think one of the most important parts of opening a restaurant is being able to ma maintain quality and consistency because the second you start slipping, you're going to lose all your customers. It's, it's yeah. really similar. Like you've really, the consistency part of a restaurant is so, 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 so important. And it's one of the hardest parts of having a restaurant being able to maintain quality, you know, from day one to day 600. Um, and when you have different people in the kitchen and chef shuffles, it's, it can be super challenging for sure. Okay. Mexican food. I love Mexican food. See, this is a, this is a thing where we're going to disagree on. <laughs> really? I like Mexican food. Yeah. I don't get the hype. Being English, we don't have good Mexican food in, in England at all. There's there's yeah. barely anywhere. It's not yeah, part yeah. of our culture. Yeah. Um, and then when I moved to America, everyone's like, Mexican food's amazing. Mexican, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. Well, it's, it's all right. It's not like, yeah. it's not amazing. Have you um, been to Mexico? Yeah. And it's really good. It's really, really good. Yeah. But it's not my favorite. Yeah. Um, what were you going to do in Tulum? Um, so similar to the concept that we're doing, in, it was a partnership with a restaurant, okay. um, sorry, with a hotel yeah. in, in Tulum called Casa Malca. Yeah. So we were taking over their like main restaurant yeah. to create a new concept, which was also going to embrace like the Mayan culture, but this like food is medicine idea, but on a slightly more casual level. Yeah. So that was like the original idea. I'm glad you're doing it in New York. <laughs> Yeah, we I mean, this is literally a decision that just happened like less than a month ago because we were going to go to L.A. for that was our plan, like forever and ever. But do you yeah, like L.A. No. that much? No, <laughs> I, I love L.A., but it just doesn't seem like the time to be there now. And I think that now that we're really focused on New York, Mike's getting really excited about it, which is awesome. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, New York is the most competitive dining scene in, city in the United States and one of the top cities for food anywhere in the world. I, yeah, so, I was going to say that. It must um, be in the world. I think he'll thrive with that challenge. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Right. And let's, of course, you have to come. <laughs> yeah, of course. We've we've just done an hour. Um, so cool. let's wrap this one up. Thank you so much for being on. It's been really nice to talk to you. Yeah, um, likewise. Thanks for having me. No worries. How can people follow you? How can people get in touch with you? Uh, just totally. do, do the stick. Um, yeah, my my main thing is Instagram and it's just at cat, K-A-T underscore Odell, O-D-E-L-L. -L. Oh, and also I should mention we have a new product out. Um, we have two new two products coming out after this. This is a, it's a neon pink CBD hot sauce called Hot Sloth. Nice. And you can find that on the, our like umbrella company is called Chill Pill Products. Okay. So what do you, uh, right. I don't know anything about Chill Pill Products. So quickly tell me about that. 
Yeah. So we partnered with um, a friend of ours who has this amazing single varietal California olive oil company with CBD and THC, but like real culinary oils are so, 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 so good. So we partnered with him. So our first product is this like neon pink CBD hot sauce. It's kind of Japanese inspired. It has miso, it has koji, shiso, umeboshi. Um, so it's sort of fermented yeah. and then um, we're selling that it's online and in stores in the U S and our Instagram tag for that is chill pill products. Cause we have a couple other products coming out down the line. Can you get it in the UK? I have to check at the moment. No, we, so we can Killing ship me, to some, some places in Europe. It just depends on the customs and because it's a cannabis product. Oh, so yeah, we have course. to like, that's, course, that's yeah, what yeah. makes it kind of tricky sometimes. We're allowed CBD in the UK now. You are? Yeah. Just. It's like you can now get like drinks and stuff like that with CBD. Oh, wow. Air. Okay. But we're so behind on the whole like weed thing. Yeah, there. it's huge here. I mean, it's like marijuana, cannabis is just getting, you know, legalized everywhere now. Do you, Is that weird? Because when you travel so much, it's not popular. It's not big anywhere else really. People smoke it, of course. But it's like, yeah. it's not a big thing apart from when you go to America. That's all people. Except like Amsterdam. About. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like in Paris, I see people sometimes smoking um, weed, but yeah, it's really big in the U S also, there's like a really big focus on the medicinal aspect yeah. and specific uh, components like using to use to treat cancer and other, yeah, yeah. other illnesses. Um, but yeah, it's huge here. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for being on and let's keep in touch. I'd, I'd love to Definitely. see you in New York and awesome. That sounds great. And eat some of Mike's food sometime. Eat all the things. <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely. totally. We'll definitely go out. Cool. Have a great Thanksgiving and I'll see you soon. Thank Take you. care. You see too. You soon. Bye. Bye. And that is a wrap. I love that one. As you can all tell, I love food. I love talking about food um, and I love eating. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, been trying to change the podcast up a little bit and just kind of get a few more different people outside of music just to kind of give people that don't just want to listen to music producers all the time. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Please share it with your friends and your family. Your mum might even like this one. You never know. Um, keep safe. Have a great one and see you soon.